It's almost a year. No. We are live. This is Literary Roadhouse. One short story once a week. I'm Remy. I'm Anais. I'm Gerald. And I'm Maya. And don't forget to join us on the Literary Roadhouse Book Club the first Friday of every month starting January 1st. Our first book is The Heart Goes Last by Margaret Atwood. And before we get started, I just want to let you know that if during the discussion we get a little excited and carried away, our language may become a little fruity. Whilst we endeavour to keep things G-rated, we occasionally wander into PG territory. If you're of a delicate disposition or you have children listening, please check the show notes on the website and in the description on the podcast host. Okay, I'll try to keep my language as unfruity as possible. I, guess. I think that means something different in the UK than it does in the US. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'll change that then. <laughs> All right, so let's get to it. This story is called Year's End by Jhumpa Lahiri. And it's about a Bengali college student named Koshik, who's in college in Boston when he receives a phone call from his dad, uh, who was supposedly away visiting family in India. And his dad tells him that he now has a new wife named Chitra, and that they and Chitra's two young daughters, Rupa and Pyu, whose father had also died previously, will be coming back with him to America in a few weeks and that Koshik would meet them over the Christmas and New Year's holidays. Uh, so Koshik's mother passed away three years before and he's still dealing with the pain of her loss. So we see Koshik grappling with his emotions as he tries to adjust to life with his new family. Um, Koshik begins to bond with the young girls. They go out together. Um, but after his father and, and Chitra, the new wife, leave the girls and Koshik at home to go to a holiday party. Koshik finds the girls looking through his mom's old photos and belongings and he lashes out at them. So in a fit of rage, he packs up his things, gets in his car and just drives away north towards Maine and along the New England coast until he eventually hits Canada. Uh, then we see the next time the family is reunited is for Koshik's college graduation, and Koshik is surprised that the girls didn't really say anything uh, or complain to the parents that Koshik had yelled at them or uh, that he left them alone in the house or anything like that. And it basically ends with him appreciating that Chitra, the new wife, is sort of trying to fill the void of uh, the one his mother left behind. Great summary, Remy. So let's just start at the top level. How does everybody feel about the story? Well, you know I liked it. <laughs> <laughs> Good. <laughs> um, I don't think Gerald's raspberry um, bodes well for his opinion of this story. So, Gerald, tell us how you really feel. We should, yeah, we should, instead of Bradbury's, we should be allowed to give raspberries instead. <laughs> Um, no, no, it was competently written, um, but I didn't get much out of it. Annie's? Yeah, I'm, uh, I think I liked it a little more than Gerald, but I, I wouldn't say I was like wowed by it. I think I've been spoiled by this podcast, so start to expect more. Yeah. I loved it, absolutely loved it. Um, you know, it wasn't like a perfect story, but we've read, there's a lot of literary fiction right now that's really, that de deals with topics of death, and I felt like this was a unique view, and it approached it in a way that was different from what I'd read previously, and I really appreciated that. I, th I think it's interesting you say different than when you read previously, because one of my thoughts was exactly the opposite, was that I feel like we've, we've read before, or I've read before, stories that are like, after the fact of the catastrophe happening, you're reading a short story of how people deal with the fallout of that catastrophe. There isn't any... There's like one major plot point would be the, the argument with the girls, but for the most part, it's it's a reflective type thing, which is fine, but I guess it was just starting to feel a little bit like competently written, good story, explores the theme well, but I just feel like I've, I've been here before. That's kind of how it felt. Yeah, I think the difference for me was... Um, Rather than, because a lot of times when you're reading about 
reading, I'm just going to call them death stories because there's so many of them. It's almost like a literary cliche at this point. Um, but I, I think what made it fresh for me was rather than it just being him dealing with his mother's death, it was him dealing with his father moving on from his mother's death, which I felt was a unique perspective on the same topic. And I think that's really what I appreciated about it. Because you're right. I, when you're a new writer or an old writer, these, these topics are really fertile ground for a lot of interesting emotions as a writer. And so we do tend to see a lot of stories about people dealing with death. It's one of those big topics, love and death. <laughs> okay, so why don't we just start out with, I mean, it seems like you and Gerald had the most issues with this story. I'm, I'm just wondering, um, you mentioned that it was a cliched topic and it felt like something you'd already read before. How did you guys feel about the language or and stuff? I mean, you said that it was competently written. Yeah, I, I think it was, I think it was over long. I think there's, there's, and, and on the second read through, I thought, you know, my initial, um, my initial um, thoughts were that it, you know, it didn't sort of, strike me as particularly good um, and on the second read through I thought well, well let's let's take it more slowly let's give it give it a chance and I just started getting irritated by the amount of detail that was put in that was inconsequential so it, it seemed like it was it was almost part of a it's almost written like a novel so there were there was there were lots of details there was lots of description of of the locations and the uh, things in those locations but which didn't really need to be there they didn't serve the purpose of the story in, in my mind and uh, so I I, th I just sort of feel that that you you could chop the thing down by a quarter or a third and and still not lose anything from the story um, and and it was it was it was easy to read, so it was it was well written in that respect. Um, but I just you I, didn't uh, connect with it. I didn't connect with it, and, and the character irritated me because he. And I don't know whether I was supposed to be irritated by him, but he, to me, everything was reflected in his mother's death, and and I kept sort of thinking, come on, it's three years, you know. Yes, it, it probably. <laughs> Hit you hard, but you, you have to move on. Gerald, everyone yeah. deals with it differently, though. <laughs> and he's a young, petulant young man. Yeah, <laughs> I, I think you know a teenager dealing with death is going to deal with it a lot differently than you know us. <laughs> There's not like an acceptable morning timeline when you should have moved on by then, you know. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> When my mom died, everyone seemed to have an opinion on how long you should mourn. <laughs> yeah. You know, mourning is an uncomfortable topic when it's so raw. Um, how, did you feel the same way, Annie, so, about the detail? Um, so, in a, in a weird way, so I, I feel like, so there's a, a point that I need, think is really clear. It's like, it's not that the topic was cliched, like yes, but you can get a lot out of the death topic. It's the structure. The the event already happened, now I'm reflexive, now there's a climatic moment with tension, now the guy walks off, drifting aimlessly from motel to motel, taking in the nature scenes. Taking in the nature scenes was probably the only part where I was kind of annoyed by the detail, because I felt like, how many stories do that? Like, everyone's polite and tense, the, tense, the tension erupts just a little bit in a very kind of, you know, way that in a Latin family we would just get over it. And then, um, <laughs> over. and then the person gets He's in the right car, there. yeah, and drives aimlessly from motel to motel, so they have no money left. And I'm like, it, that, it's just a structure that felt a little like I've seen this before. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't mind the structure. It felt like a really honest story. I liked the detail. Um, one of the things that I really liked about the story was it felt very. <clears throat> It felt really um, grounded in its upper middle class Indianness. You know, um, there all that detail lended 
a slight twist on something I'd seen before and it colored everything slightly differently because of the cultural background, because of how they moved to the house, his time away. So her death was also, like him coming back to America was was inherently entwined with his mother getting sick and that's entwined with the house because he purchased it right before she got sick and you know all those things were were part of like the same experience and I felt like the detail made that really obvious and I felt like without the detail I would have missed out on some of that cultural reflection and I enjoyed that I enjoyed the how grounded the culture was in this story how about you, Gerald, Riley? You were sitting over there quiet. Yeah, Gerald, I'm surprised that you were able to get to the story twice because it was pretty long. Um, but I, so when you are saying like a lot of the, what? Sorry, something got turned on out of nowhere. We'll have to That's cut okay. that out. Um, when you were saying like lots of the details and descriptions felt superfluous, I, I think, okay, I agree with you in terms of the scenery and stuff, but I think the descriptions for the people really brought them to life for me. And, and, and um, the character portrayals, like the nuanced things, made it much more real. And for me, you know, I, I guess maybe we're looking at this through slightly different perspectives, but Anais was saying, you know, oh, you know, they're driving aimlessly and stuff. It's like cliched. It's expected, like looking at it in a framework of a story. But I actually could picture myself in the narrator's shoes. And maybe, you know, some things do seem cliche because it could be people's natural reaction to things, to just want to escape, get away from it all. But I, like, and... I'm going to share like later on like some similarities, some eerie similarities that I felt in the story, but I definitely like personally related to the narrator. You know, and while the descriptions of the environment and nature could be seen as, you know, a little on the heavy side, I felt like they reflected his internal feelings. Like when someone's died and you're like you're in that kind of just frantic like your peak emotional experience everything seems like either really bright or really dark and it seemed like how he was seeing the environment outside his car window was reflection of him diving deeper and deeper into his emotional grief so that he could come out the other side and so as he's driving the water's getting darker the water's getting choppier everything's looking grayer you know and I appreciated that bit of resonance with his own emotions and so yeah the story was a little long but I didn't mind it because I, I felt like it added something for me Oh, oh. I was just gonna say, I, I agree. With you. <laughs> Gerald's over there making yeah. faces. I wish faces. I could take his faces and somehow get them into the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was just gonna say, I agree absolutely that the nature is reflecting his internal world. But that's that's exactly it. That's exactly what I mean. I'm like, I've, how many times have we seen stormy, bleak nature reflecting? But you know what? Life. It's literature. Like the human experience, there are only so many things that everybody like freaking experiences, like and there's there is some variation, but there ain't that much variation. Yeah. <laughs> one, one thing that I did quite like, actually, uh, which I, I think isn't dealt with much in literature, is, or in fact anywhere really, is the relationship between. Um, between children and new stepchildren and and yeah. new relationships and and because I have experience of that and it's 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 kind of interesting to see how he deals with the the fairly sudden introduction of of a new family into his into his life um, that is connected to him but not related to him um, uh, so so that I I, I liked. I like the fact that that subject was, was, was dealt with in this case. I'm glad you said that because it didn't dawn on me until you just said that. But, you know, I, I enjoyed his relationship with the two girls. I really thought it was cute and I actually chuckled a little bit when he turns to his father. He's like, what do you expect me to do, play with them? <laughs> you know? it's like, oh, come on, Dad. <laughs> um, but one thing that I just realized is, you know, those girls – were the only times when he was kind of relaxed in the house. Like, they kind of allowed him to let his guard down, which is what led to him lashing out to at them rather than lashing out at his family. And that was an important emotional 
barrier for him to let go of. And the girls allowed him to do that because of that interesting, unique relationship between an older sibling and new, younger stepkids. And that's something I personally haven't experienced, and it was lovely to see it on paper. Yeah, and, and I think it was it was interesting that that through the girls he didn't he 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 didn't view the girls as a threat to him and his relationship with his father and and his feelings because they were just girls. He, once he got to know them, they were just girls, and and they you know he could entertain them and and take them out and stuff, and 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 he seemed to enjoy that. So so they were. I suppose helping him, helping draw him in, and, and until the, the time that they, he saw them, you know, looking at the photos of his mother, and, and uh, that's when it all went bad. Yeah, it all went really bad. But also, I think I I really enjoyed how there was this unsaid intimacy between him and the girls. Like they all kind of understood where each other was at to the point that after he does lash out, they don't say anything about it. They don't run home to mom and say, he screamed at us and said, the only reason why you're here is to wash dad's socks, you know? <laughs> but I think that's more of like a cultural upbringing type of thing. Like he, even like on the, the, the outings to like the museum, he says like they were very um, polite and didn't complain. And even, you know, the room was basically left untouched and it's just like they don't really tattle or, or, or like do that sort of thing. True, but he was a bit extreme. Oh, for sure. Like, like even you know, and he's frightened the little daylight out of them. Mm. And for them not to say anything, I think for me that that said something. You know, I I appreciated that. But yeah, you're probably right. There was definitely a cultural element there. How about you, Annie's? Yeah, and I think there's also one thing that was explored that felt very true to me was the tension between um, immigrants from the same country, the ones who've been here for a few years and already feel like they've you know, well, if it's in America, Americanized, or, or to whatever, you know, new country it is, acclimatized to the culture, and then the new one comes in, and it's like, you know, there's, there's always, like, some kind of derogatory term, like, even the, in the Cuban community, the ones who've been here, like, 5, 10, 15, 20 years feel so superior to the ones, like, coming in right now. And there how was, quickly they forget. How quickly they forget, <laughs> I know, as if he didn't look just like those girls when he first arrived. <laughs> yeah. And I think, I think, um, we were seeing it from his perspective because we already knew that was his thoughts before he actually said it because he's like judging everything that Chitra does. But then um, I think on their end as well, they probably do feel a little inferior because they feel like they don't know English well enough, they're not dressed properly, they don't know how anything works. And that has a silencing effect as well. Yeah, and the difference between the two women, between Chitra and the wife, um, his mother, are so stark, mm. you know, like, she's obviously comes from a very educated, you know, background. She's very modern in her sense of taste. And then he comes back with <laughs> the woman that his parents probably would have completely approved of, you know. And he met his first wife through seeing her and deciding instantly she was going to be the one and asking for her hand. Whereas the second one was a request. Um, and, and so there... I, I liked how that was set up, that the two women were so different, you know, even to the point of putting a tablecloth on a table that really shouldn't have a tablecloth on it. Like, like I, I, those little touches I really appreciated because I could totally see this totally traditional, a little bit old-fashioned younger woman in this huge freaking concrete and glass modern style house <laughs> full of all this expensive artwork to the point where she's like, why is there no railing on the stairs? <laughs> but that, don't you think that was a little little overdone? Oh, I liked it. I liked it. It seemed really real to me. I've been in big houses where I felt totally out of place, and I'm like, I could not live here. Oh, I'm, I'm sure. I, I, you know, it, it felt very real, but I, I think it, the writer just sort of hammered that again and again. You know, she's, she's in a culturally un, uh, uncomfortable environment, and... and you know, with with the the history of the wife and the the place and and I I just think yeah. I well, this brings to mind an, an interesting topic because when you're talking about diverse fiction, um, there's a theory that says that when you're talking about diverse characters from diverse background, you have to be a little bit more heavy-handed with it because Caucasian readers will um, unconsciously kind of wipe everything over 
with what is considered standard culture. So you get the case of you have a black character in a book, you say they're black in the beginning of the book, and by the middle of the book, the reader has decided they're white. And then they, they put out a movie, and everyone's shocked that it's a black character when it's in the freaking book. And things like that happen not just with race, but also with culture. So that if you have a character with a different culture and you're not really explicit about it, explicit about the differences, people will automatically assume those differences don't exist because they don't have experience with those cultures. And so I feel like if this was a story about this Indian family written for an Indian audience, it probably would have had a lot more things cut out of it. It would have had a lot more nuance and subtlety to it. But because it's written for a more mainstream audience, it has to be a little bit more explicit in order to get those differences across. But, but don't you think that by, by setting the, the, the family in this modernist concrete and glass house, that Caucasian readers would relate to that and picture that and and because because I can you know I can I can see we have a lot of them around here uh, so I I see the house and I see the sort of woman that the, the the dead mother wife was and and as soon as you know as, as soon as he walks in and he smells cooking and and he said that's you know I forget what he says but he said that's that's unusual um and you think, ah, here's a, here's a cultural difference. She doesn't speak the language very well, blah, 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 blah. And then you go, blah, 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 blah. And, and it feels like I've been hit over the head with hammer. I just, I get it. I get it. She's different. Yeah, see, I didn't think it was overdone. But I can see how you could think that. Especially if you have a lot of experience with the culture, it can be a little bit overdone. But I think that it was well done for me. Um, you know, I haven't been intimately, like, I've known a lot of people from India, but I haven't been intimately involved with anyone from India to the point where I would instantly know, you know, this traditional woman in a modern house would be that uncomfortable and that bristling against the sides of the walls. Um, so, I don't know. I think it's personal yeah. preference, really. You know, yeah. um, I can definitely see how that would be a bit much, though. Yeah. It just yeah, didn't bother I can me. See it too, Gerald. Um, but I mean, for me, I was just like picking up some similarities or how I can picture people, you know, from my own culture reacting and things like that. And I was like, oh yeah, that's true. Like for example, like one thing I kind of didn't like was how the story. Well, I mean, I understand it's like the character's viewpoint, but it, it, they sort of like conflate old-fashioned to mean like religious so for example like the father hiding the liquor and saying oh she's a bit old-fashioned so like 90 percent of the Bengali population is Muslim approximately so it, it probably means like she she's more religious about it but I, I feel like you know there's a difference but again it was coming from to, to like um, portray the, the perspective of the father um, and also it's emblematic f with a lot of people once they come to America and they sort of acclimate, they might stray away from the religious practices they grew up with and so forth. Well, I didn't even get that. I didn't know that um, they were mostly Muslim. So when, when the thing with the alcohol hit, I just assumed he had been drinking too much and his new wife probably would not approve. <laughs> like, I, I just totally wiped like that right that off he's drunk. Uh, maybe. I, I, I think but it's that he was drinking that's a perfect example of yeah. me being unfamiliar with the culture and just kind of, you know, for lack of a better term, whitewashing the story to fit my own point of view <laughs> because there was no other, other information coming in. If I had known that background information, I probably would have seen that scene much more similar to how you saw it. How about you, Annie's? Yeah, I didn't know that most of the Bengali population was with them either. But I said they were Hindu. Yeah, I didn't know, but I will say that um, I didn't think it was alcoholism either. I thought I thought it was more like a fear in villages of like alcoholism in the family, like an alcoholic patriarch. So I went in a completely different direction. Not that he was being alcoholic, but that any sign of it is cause for alarm. Yeah, yeah. I think you and I probably saw that more similar. Mm -hmm. well, I, I think I think there were signs of, of alcoholism because he 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 referred to the um, the cooking and and. He, he made mention that mostly his father would have a, a jar of almonds and whiskey for for his meal. So I I think there was 
I, know I think there was problematic drinking. I don't know yeah. if I would go so far as to say alcoholism, but I think he was drowning his grief in alcohol for sure. And, you know, the fact that he encouraged his son to join in so he didn't have to drink alone kind of said to me that there were two dudes in a bachelor pad that was way too big for them. <laughs> Both of them sad and unwilling to yeah. communicate. So where's the bottle of Jack? <laughs> So, though I got the sense it was like a family tradition because it was that the son was replacing the mother as a drinking companion. The mom used to drink Johnny Walker too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Alive. Yeah. But I don't think they were probably drinking as much. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so now that we've got a good idea of what Annie used and Gerald didn't like about the story, Remy, was there anything yeah. about the story that you didn't like? Um, I think the length, I think, uh, like Gerald was saying, it was a bit long, um, but besides that, not really. Yeah, I didn't even have that. I, You know, it was long, but it didn't bother me. I was kind of, I felt like I was on this journey with it, and I also felt like the story had a fairly distant point of view, not as distant as last week, but still fairly distant, but it kept me, whereas last week it, it kind of lost me. Um, a little bit on the on just how distant, but um, I liked the point of view in this story. It was distant, but it was reflective. But it wasn't so distant that it had like that modern tone that I that we talked about last week. Um, I enjoyed that. Was there anything about the story that you guys did like, Gerald and Ennis? Um Yeah, as, as I said, I, I liked uh, I liked the writing. It was. It, it, the, the the length wasn't wasn't a problem as far as as far as the reading is concerned. I, I just think the the length was unnecessarily long, um, but I enjoyed reading it. That's that's for sure. It was it was an, uh, a quotes easy read. Um, the, there was nothing to to trip me up. So it was it was very competently written. Um, and as I say, the, I I like the, the the dealing with with um, Children after, after a a, a death, um, uh, but but yeah, he he, you know, the the main character annoyed me. He, he seemed to have very few redeeming qualities. He <laughs> he, he was I don't know. He, he the, the first time he takes the, the the two girls out, and he knows that that the mother is is anxious and doesn't want to be left alone, and she's anxious for the chip for the the two daughters and he doesn't go to the local Dunkin Donuts he goes to the next town because he, he wants to drive a bit further and I just think what a yeah. what a, what a <laughs> beep 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 <laughs> but listen go on. I think it's not fair to judge him from our perspective I think you have to judge him from like a college age view mm -hmm. right yeah, that's yeah right. I mean, he definitely felt like very honest to what a modern college student who's dealing with crap would probably be doing. Because they're like when I was that age, I was kind of self-absorbed, and my pain was the biggest pain in the whole world, and nobody else's pain was as big as mine. <laughs> no one has ever lost a mother. <laughs> you know, yeah. Like, yeah. At least yeah. if they did, they wasn't as bad as mine. <laughs> yeah, I, definitely. I get what Gerald's saying, but he never annoyed me because. I guess having two younger brothers and having seen them gone through that age and one of them hasn't quite left it yet, even though they probably uh, <laughs> Be you know, nice, we might need another jingle out of it. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so, yeah, so then I, I just see it and I'm like, hey, you're a good kid at heart, you're just being a teenager right now. You're like 19 <laughs> or 20. You know, I think to me, like, I trusted that the narrator was a good kid. He just is young. <laughs> I'm, I'm you just, know, from I'm now just, on, whenever we say competently written, all I hear is a sideways, like, like it doesn't sound positive. When it someone says, is yes, that story was competently written, it's like, <laughs> whack across the face. <laughs> I don't want to hear that as a writer. <laughs> That's like, you know, you're so well spoken. Whack. <laughs> and, you know, and the story, I was... The only I think I think the part where the story really lost me was the aimlessly driving from motel to motel with nature, you know, with bleak nature scenes. Because before that, I was really you know into it. I I didn't mind the details about the house or the relationships. I liked everything that happened with the stepsisters. But until he just started driving motel to motel, I think that's when I like my eye started to drift. 
I love that part, and you've ruined it, because now all I see is every single film where yeah. the upstate character drives through the countryside feeling their grief, and that's okay, because I like that, so dang it, I'm going to own it. <laughs> I like those scenes. <laughs> you're, you're welcome to them. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I, there, was, there were several things that really struck me. I like the fact that we actually saw through his eyes the moment when the father and the new wife start to really connect on like a more relaxed level. I like that. Um, in particular, I love the line uh, when he says, where the dad says, this is where America's Brahmins live. He said, laughing at his own joke, and in the front seat, Chitra smiled in a way that revealed to me that she was falling in love. I loved that. Yeah, I, like <laughs> I was just like, oh my goodness. And okay, here comes the writer nerd in me. I loved the way grammar was used in this story. <laughs> the grammar was different from like a lot of the modern stories we've been reading. It a lot of times it had like a throwback to a slightly older grammar and it was interesting. The sentences were longer, interesting uses of commas. I loved my commas. I was like, yes, those are beautiful, elegant commas. I have I actually wrote down Elegant punctuation <laughs> in my notes, and that's some okay. I know that sounds really lame and geeky, but usually, like especially now after having Hemingway drilled into our heads, we're like periods, 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 commas are evil. Don't overuse commas, and you know I kind of like this more elegant, slightly old-fashioned style of grammar. But, but isn't you saying he, they use punctuation nicely? Isn't that? Just like saying competently written. <laughs> no, no, it's different because usually, usually punctuation is just there. Okay, yeah. it's just there. It's just utilitarian. I actually think it added something to the story. I felt like the way it was punctuated, the way the grammar was used, was elegant in a way that made me think, wow, that's really beautiful. Mm, that's, and yeah, no, I feel like a total dork. Yeah. Not, the author is a professor at Princeton, so he's probably teaching some good grammar to the students. <laughs> it's quite it's quite interesting that that you 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 take the grammar as it was and and you say added to the story because because with me grammar, if if the height of grammar is that it doesn't get in the way, so so everything. Oh, for me it's very different, but I think that's because I um I actually took a class a long time ago that was um one of our textbooks was rhetorical use of grammar and how grammar can be just as important as the words we choose and how grammar can change meanings of the same sentences and add and subtract from writing rather than just being something that's a stop sign and um, it's something I haven't actually seen in fiction very often at least modern fiction um, and that's why it stood out to me like as I was reading it it stood out to me because it's something I haven't seen and it was so precise and so beautifully done Rather than just being something that was there because the sentence needed to make sense. Okay. I feel like the dialogue was well integrated into the story. Like sometimes when it goes back and forth like that, it could seem choppy. But in that sense, I agree with you. Yeah, I, I do separate the difference between competent and artistic use of grammar. To me, they're very different things. I feel like when we say competent writer, at least for me, I don't know for you guys, but I think it's probably a dog whistle for like, I know that the story is absolutely healthy and sound, like I can't pick it apart, it just didn't throw me for whatever reason. Like me personally as a reader, was not thrilled. Oh. I think yeah. that's what it means. Yeah. yeah, I definitely don't want to be called a competent writer. Yeah, exactly. It's not really, it's, 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 it's kind of just like I acknowledge that you know your craft, author. You like, know what, Annie? you're so articulate. <laughs> 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 and the thing is, when when I looked at this author and her like Wikipedia page has like other um, uh, themes that she tends to explore, I'm like, I wish we read that story. I wish we read that story. You know, so well, I, I'm gonna probably read those stories because I like yeah, this author. I, so I, yeah, but I think also what competently written. What I mean is, I trust the author that I know if I go in and read her other stories, the ones that you have to pay for, they're probably gonna be better. You know. Oh. <laughs> That's so funny. So is there anything else that we'd like to hash out before we get into reading the story? Yes. So the similarities. I Jump think. right in. Okay. Koshik's dad is a civil engineer. My dad is a civil engineer. <laughs> is this like the Adele thing? <laughs> no, wait, wait till we get to the game. All right. His favorite donut is the Boston cream. 
My favorite donut is also the Boston Green. <laughs> <laughs> um, his parents met when his father saw his mom at a wedding and uh, was attracted to her and asked for her hand. That's how my cousin met her husband. You're kidding me. <laughs> no. This story was written for you, dear. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, that's why I'm saying, like, I keep going back to this, but it actually felt very real for me. You know, Chitra, the new wife, um, her emphasis on koshik eating, that's something I can totally picture, you know, someone from that kind of culture doing. Um, his mom, uh, she kept, like, her valuables hidden in a suitcase on a closet shelf. Also something that I feel like a lot of people can do, uh, would do, I mean. Um, yeah, because you've got to leave in a hurry. Yeah, and, and, and d her insisting that all her citras and her, you know, beautiful flowy garments are, are donated to people back in India because she didn't want them turning into curtains. Like, at all. <laughs> <laughs> I love that, by like the way. something people yeah. would say and do. Oh, and also when he took the girls out to donuts, their unfamiliarity with idioms. So he said, you know, it's not a big deal. And she was like, big deal, what's that? And he had to explain it means not important. So mm -hmm. I liked all of it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I just, in general, just really love the story. I liked um, the resonance of the environment and his emotions. I liked the relationships between the people. The relationships were, felt very real. And in general, I just really, really love the story. Oops. So are we ready to rate? Yeah, I thought yeah. that was a, a lead into a rating. Sounds mm. like it. So what are you guys going to give the story? Who's going to go first? Okay, You're Gerald, going, just get it out of the way. <laughs> Three and a half. Ouch! That's lower than I thought you would go, Gerald. I know, that was lower than I thought he would go, too. Ouch. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't. I thought you had the coffee. sunshine outside the window. You were showing me before the. <laughs> it's, it's gone. It's, it's gone. Cloudy. <laughs> the story sucked <laughs> it all away. <laughs> no, the three and a half is above average. So. Not the way we rate on this show. <laughs> no, no, not really. <laughs> we inflate. We grade on a curve. We're around yeah. the 80. Yeah. We aim for the, the average of an 80, not a 50. <laughs> um, okay, who's next? I can go next. I'm giving it a four and a half. I was originally going to give it a four, but then you guys reminded me that most of the story isn't bleak nature scenes, so that I bumped it up to a half, because everything before I really liked. And you? Five. I'm giving it a five as well. I toyed with a five and a half. It's just not quite there, but it's really close. Like, yep. I think five is a good solid rating. Before we move on, I need to go grab my external cord because my computer looks like it's going to die. I'll be right back. So, yeah, about weddings, like, I, I really think it's a very interesting cultural phenomenon because... It's sort of seen like you attend weddings to get married. Like you go there to, to see and be seen type of thing. It's very interesting. That's why the, uh, well, not all cultures, but a lot of cultures in the Christian culture have the bouquet. Thing. Sorry about that, guys. Thank goodness uh, for editing, right? Mm -hmm. We started yeah, talking about weddings. <laughs> Quite interesting. About a couple of years ago, we started having programs on TV about about gypsies, um, and it was I think the first one was my big fat gypsy wedding or something. So it's and, and, and gypsies when they get married, you know, it's, it's sparkly coaches, you know, it, it, the whole nine yards. Um, but that's that's quite often the young people go to a a, a wedding to eye up a, a potential future partner. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Well, there's love in the air. <laughs> not, not round here, there isn't. Not that that's a cliche or anything. You know, I don't want to offend any sensibilities by using cliches. <laughs> okay, one more comment about that. Okay, I think, I think. Okay, you were saying like this death thing was cliched, but I think adding the cultural component to it is what made it unique. That, Thank yes, you. Yeah, yeah. But it's not like the thing, guys. It's specifically the, you know, he's sad because the water is choppy. And, no, and okay. not only, mm, not only is it bleak nature scenes, but it's bleak 
New England, nature scenes in the winter. Like, specifically... <laughs> Like, yeah. it's not even, like, he went back to, like, you know... Florida. Calcutta or something. Yeah, or something else. It's okay, here's the thing. This is probably why it did not bother me. Because I like the fact that they were an East Coast Indian family. Because I, I, I liked what that said about the family. So, naturally, if he's going to go driving, it has to be on the East Coast. But when my mom died, I actually did drive through the Nevada desert. That's what I mean. <laughs> it was like driving that's... through the desert, staring at the bleak landscape, feeling all the cliched feelings that Annie's was so offended by, <laughs> watching my emotions being reflected at me through the lack of brush. <laughs> that's like saying, oh, it's cliché for someone to like bottle themselves up and lock themselves in the house and watch TV all day eating ice cream after like a breakup okay but it's not something do I've done yeah do them exactly yeah but it's make for an interesting read I guess for me like well, that's what I mean like you're seeing it in the context of like how is it as a story but like if you try to relate it to like what would people well, actually Well this is do where being a writer fiction. kind of sucks for reading fiction because <laughs> it kind of ruins your fiction um, I'm finding that the more I write the more like I have a hard time suspending my writer hat and I start analyzing and tearing apart things as I'm reading them I'm getting to the point now where I'm trying to not read a lot of the stories twice because I'm finding that I lose my enjoyment because I start getting really into the nitty gritty of them and how they're constructed and stuff. And that's something I never had to deal with before. I'm like, man, being a writer has yeah. ruined reading. I feel <laughs> sorry for you. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that didn't sound very sorry. <laughs> Just rub it in, why don't you? Okay, so what are we submitting for next week? Well, I'm I'm having second thoughts now because it's a it's a story about after a climatic event or climatic event, <laughs> reflections on that again. <laughs> but, but I'd like to submit uh, prepositions by Lionel Shriver. Okay. And I am submitting "In Search of a Man for Friendship and Possibly More" by Empar Molinar. And I'm submitting Contamination by Janela Ocparanta. Hopefully I said that okay. All right. Okay. This okay. is the for butchering names, I guess. I was going to say that, but I didn't want to sound... Messed. Okay. No, we, we own our inadequacies <laughs> on this podcast. <laughs> okay. Since the end of the year usually warrants a time for reflection, I'd like to play a different type of game. So... Instead of multiple choice, it'll be open-ended responses. So I would like you to share the best story you had in the past year. And by best, it could be the funniest moment, the proudest accomplishment, crazy experience, anything you want. And I will unbiasedly, impartially, and completely <laughs> objectively pick the best one. Wow. Love, <laughs> um, Yeah. Do you want to kill him or should I? <laughs> Wait, I'm confused. Is it is it stories we read for the podcast or our own personal stories? No, he wants us personal. to bear our souls to the podcast. Well, I can't bear my soul right now. He wants us better hours. souls to bear. I'm in four hours of sleep. It's not happening. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Wow. Um, that sucks. <laughs> I was gonna go no, first. I feel no, I know, but I feel like the reader, the the listeners deserve to know you on a more personal level. Oh as God, well. this has been a year from hell, though. I'm like, what can I actually say on the show? <laughs> 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 and Anise knows where I'm coming from. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> hmm. Yeah, I don't really know. So wait, we're going for any story we want that has a big emotional impact. Should it be about that? No, I mean any. No, one. us. He There's wants no to hear criteria. a personal story. Yeah. Gerald over there is thinking of one. He's very focused. Gerald's taking it seriously. <laughs> Sorry, I thought we were supposed to take it. <laughs> um. I don't. Remy, there's going to be a lot of like silence here on the YouTube one. Okay. That's okay. We can cut it out. Yeah, for the okay, audio. I'll, well, yeah, okay. true. Okay, Gerald's okay. got it. A nice, a nice little little story. Um, positive story. <coughs> Those exist. <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course. Um, yeah, it, it was, it was, and it sounds a bit strange, but but when we were on our, our road trip in the summer in in our RV. 
in France. Um, I, because of the way technology has changed and things have become cheaper and more accessible, um, I was able to post a picture just about every day of where we were, what the scenery, this sort of thing, onto Facebook. And it's the first time I've done this, and it's a, it's it's sort of, I don't know, it's it's keeping people back home in touch with what we're doing and where we're going and this sort of thing. And towards the end of the trip, we we turned off the place. And you know, my wife and the dog took a walk off, and and I was just sort of doing stuff. And then somebody came and said, "Are you Gerald?" And, and my <laughs> instant reaction is, "No." <laughs> 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 and uh, and what had happened is that is that some friends that we'd met five years ago in Germany on on another trip had been seeing our photos that I've been putting up as as we were going along and guessed that we were going to turn up at this place and driven there in front of us and parked up and, and said, um, and, and said we thought you'd be here, so we thought we'd come and meet you. So that's a nice... nice that's trip. awesome! That's awesome. How, did, how did he feel about you lying when he asked, are you Gerald, and you said no? <laughs> <laughs> it was all right. <laughs> but how did you feel about him stalking you? <laughs> 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 it was good because it, it was all good. It was nice, a nice time. I had a nice few days with him, so that was good. Because it's not even him going to a place that you said you were at that time. He actually oh. guessed where you were yeah. going to be. That's he, crazy. He sort of followed us on a map and thought... Well, that I'm only works this. if you're a guy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I guess. Anyway, that's, that's pretty awesome. Thank you. Annie's? I don't know, I'm struggling. I was going to say Maya. Me too, I'm really I struggling here. Especially... Anais, you travel all the time. You should have... I know, but that's why all my stories just sound kind of like, and then I was at this beach and it was great. And then I was... It's the traveler's version of driving through bleak areas in North England. <laughs> and, and then I feel like you're pretty grand right now. Um, I don't know. I feel like since my mom always comes up in this podcast, because, you know, in the beginning, she used to always... she's awesome. Yeah, awesome. And she used to always do all the stories behind the stories. It was like, she was like a conspiracy theorist of, you know, fiction. Um, so she came down in November to, to Costa Rica because she just needed, like, a reset button. I probably shouldn't say how old she turned this year. But it's one of the ones that ends in zero and terrifies people. <laughs> and she hasn't been coping well with, you know, the transition <laughs> to aging. She had to just come down. And uh, she was like, well, so there's the hot springs, a lot of volcanoes in Costa Rica. She was like, oh, let's go to the hot springs and unwind. So our plan was to go up to one of the volcanoes, go to a hot spring. But we get there, and there's this group of, like, young 20-year-olds who were going to go out on a boat on a lake house. And... Um, and we just completely forgot about the hot springs. Like, they were like, do you ladies want to come? And it, it kind of restored my faith in young people because all of us are in our 20s except for her, but they're treating her as if she's in her 20s. She partied harder than anyone else. Like, I had never seen my mom this way. She's, like, revealing all these secrets. She's, like, jumping off the boat into the lake. She, we're in the shuttle, so nobody had to drive. We're, like, going from the boat back to the hotel. And she's like, are we going to a funeral? She grabs a bottle of Bacardi. She starts passing it around. Like, she really needed it. And it was, like, a reset button. It was interesting to watch it be a reset button on her, like, emotional state just to be like the other 20-year-olds because she, like, never does that. She never, you know, like, to that level of crazy. And then there's a parallel with my grandmother discovering, she had never had a computer before, discovering Facebook, and it, like, cured her. She, like, no longer go, needs to go to the hospital. She dances again. So it was a, a year for me, I guess, on reflections on how, I guess, like, engaging with your youth does make you young, physically and emotionally, touching back oh, on totally. that. totally. Yeah. That's beautiful. <clears throat> well, I, I, this is such a hard... Quiz, ah, uh, Rami. Uh, he's not allowed to win anymore for a while. <laughs> no, you're done, Rami. Let's go back to Adele. <laughs> well, it's not going to be um, a huge surprise that to frequent listeners, because I'm pretty transparent. Whatever I think somehow instantly comes out of my mouth. And so, in my youth, before I got pregnant, I was pretty wild. 
um, but just enough that I wouldn't get into too much trouble. And I was traveling and um, just showing up in various cities in the U.S. without any money or plans. And that's I was planning on doing that overseas eventually, and then I got pregnant, and that kind of forced me to settle down. And over this past year, my twins turned 18 years old. My son's still in high school, but they're both like, I have like an almost empty nest. And all of a sudden, I felt all these old... Um, all these old plans start to creep back up into my life because I, I you, you kind of set them aside when you're a single mom. You're like, well, yeah, I, I was going to do that, but now I have to be all like, you know, responsible now. And so over the past year, I found myself just naturally starting to reconnect with some of those old dreams and um, starting to take action on them. Things like getting rid of a lot of my belongings, starting to pare things down so that it will be easier for me to just pick up and go. And um, yeah, so this year has really been one of rediscovering a lot of those dreams, focusing on my writing and preparing to leave the country. Wow. Very good. Uh, I, I, I uh, really appreciate that both you and Anais had these stories with like larger messages um, mm -hmm. and motifs. It's, it's almost sounded like you're summarizing a story we were reading. Um, <laughs> But okay, I'm gonna yeah, pick Yeah, one Gerald. of those lame cliche. <laughs> <laughs> I'm picking Gerald just because I, I it's it, I think it's a really cool kind of neat story and it's a cool coincidence. Oh, yeah, a coincidence. Great stalking story. Yeah, <laughs> very much. Well. It only ends well if like they appear tomorrow night <laughs> with guns but drawn. I, I don't know how they <laughs> took that risk. Like, like they drove. Did they drive a pretty long distance? And it's like, okay, I assume he's going to show up. And I assume yeah, yeah. this is going to be a positive thing. <laughs> but I guess for them, I guess for them, it doesn't That's matter. That's pretty awesome. Wrong. It doesn't matter. They're still in the cool. It was a nice drive. Yeah, yeah, it, yeah it, it, I, I think so. There was there wasn't a lot of risk, and and but it it was sort of kind of nice that we had no idea, and there was no communicate, no direct communication between us, and and no, oh, if you're going there, then we'll see you. It was just bang, they were there. So it's I still like I still like I Gerald's instinct. Are you Gerald? What? <laughs> I've never even heard of that game. <laughs> Gerald who? What? No, my name is Richard. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's kind of funny because because I, I used to be very active on a on a big forum for, for motorhomes and and it used to happen all the time that that people would would read stuff that I'd written because I was I was under a different um, like a different username and uh, so I, they they sort of come up and say are you Gerald and you think what have I said what have I written <laughs> so are you here to kill me. <laughs> 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 yeah, and if you're gonna kill me, kill me in an interesting way. Yeah. I I can't die in a lame way. My kids have decreed I'm 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 allowed to die if I'm like climbing like Mount Everest or something, but I'm not allowed to have some lame death like like getting kidnapped or something. It has to be a really good death. <laughs> and that we could read it in a good story. Exactly. Yeah. I've taught my children well. <laughs> So what are we reading next week, Daryl? We're reading Prepositions by Lionel Shriver. Okay. But in the meantime, don't hide your thoughts in a shoebox in a closet. Head over to literaryroadhouse.com and share your thoughts with us in the comment section. While you're there, please leave a review on iTunes, Stitcher, and Spreaker, then share this podcast with your friends. Until next time, read a good story. Read a good story. <laughs> do, 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 do